Hello and welcome to episode 96 of The Garden Log with me, Ben Dark. I am a gardener and this is a gardening podcast. Today I'm talking about shrubs mainly. I'm talking about one group of shrubs from over in the Himalayan foothills and another from the wild bear-filled forests of the Canadian-American borders. But both of them have become completely quotidian and mundane, settled here in our European gardens, so we no longer think of them as exotic interlopers. I'm also talking a little bit about soil. That's how to tell if you are listening to a gardening podcast. Do they talk about soil? Oh, it sounds like a gardening podcast to me. Now, I have a little bit of housekeeping promo news to start with. I'm going on a super short little first week of April mini tour. The loveliest week of spring spent, I hope, in the loveliest of company. I hope to see some of you at these evening events. I'm going to be talking about, about The Grove, of course, this book that I've written about the, the everyday beauties on, on a city street. And I'm going to be there in Bath at Topping and Company, a beautiful, beautiful bookshop, on the 4th of April, as a Monday, at 7.30. And then I'm going to One Tree Books in Petersfield on the 6th of April, that's the Wednesday, at 6.30. That's the, the homecoming tour. I'm from Petersfield. So that's the moment that all schoolboys dream of when they show those teachers and all of those who doubted them by, by coming back to, to talk about plants in a local bookshop. And I'm talking at the Garden Museum, finally, on the 8th of April. And that's a sort of launch event, as well as a talk. I'm going to be in conversation with Alice Vincent, the, the writer and journalist, who's very, very good at these things, who's very, very bright and switched on. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to draw some interesting conversation out of me. It really would be fantastic to see some friendly faces at those events. So do come along and say hello, and I'll, I'll scroll something in, in a book for you and send you away with, with all sorts of gardening thoughts in your head. Anyway, sorry for the promotion. Enough of that. Let's get on with the week in gardening. Welcome to the week in gardening. I began by cutting back a great, vast, white buddleia, the kind of buddleia that, that Captain Ahab would fantasize about. This thing lies at the end of the garden, and I have left it upright and unpruned all through the winter. And this is very bad behavior in those who wish to preserve the nature and native fauna of Copenhagen, because I'm certain it's sending its seeds out all over the place, little winged seeds that catch the air and flush around in dry weather. I know last week I was talking about seed dispersal mechanisms. Buddleia's seed capsules release in dry weather and close up again when they swell with moisture in wet weather. I guess the plant reasons that little paper aeroplanes sail further when they don't get sogged down by great lumps of rain falling on them from above. Anyway, the Buddleia seed heads have been up, and that is because I really like the, the ornamental effect, not only because it gives that sensation of time having passed in the garden, that sense that flowering occurred here and will occur again, but because they are a beautiful shape. On a very well-flowered, big, giant buddleia, not, not one of these horrible little dwarf things that they've bred now that could be a, a hebe for, for all the impact it makes. On the big, giant ones, they look like a pike staff's head or a fleur-de-lis on the end of a big, long pole 
they've got those two side florets that tend to curl down and the big central floret like like a giraffe's tongue coming out there and i think it is a dramatic and lovely thing to see particularly against the big pale nordic sky it's all in the plants growth this 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 effect that they have because they flower on new wood on wood put in that season they can hold their blooms so fantastically and starkly aloft like that a tree like a lilac so often compared to the buddleia so often regarded as the buddleia's more beautiful sister the lilac flowers on the previous year's wood which means it tends to flower surrounded by those glorious heart-shaped leaves and for that reason it can't compete in terms of silhouette it might be able to compete in terms of beauty and of scent and of place in the nation's heart and references in fantastic poems but the buddleia wins on flowers out all winter i think on a few other things as well probably on personality on, on scrappiness on having lovely silvery shiny leaves on ability to grow in smashed up piles of fly tipped asbestos and other and other areas because pruning is more than just following a handbook because pruning is 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 bending to to our will i was thinking about how much growth i could get out of the butler in one year so that it still held its blooms above the fence line so it still held them high in contrast to the sky and i think i could probably get 5 foot of growth in a year so i took them down to about 3 foot below the the fence line so that they can be big and bursting and exploding up there by the end of next summer and again all through the next winter i've been thinking quite a lot about buddleia this week i've been writing an article about it for the big issue and in that article i was focusing on its on its characteristics as disreputable but lovable urban rogue and i came across this fantastic article by an ecologist let me try and remember his name i've got it written down around me around here somewhere um, he's called michael j crawley michael j crawley and and um he will be known to to those of you who are particularly good at urban plant communities he's written fantastically about the the plants of london particularly i like his stuff on the canal towpaths the canal towpaths of london might be seen as nature corridors and they are in a sense but not in the way that that a railway embankment is a nature corridor or even a, a motorway embankment with all those backdrafts from cars dragging seeds along it a canal towpath tends to be almost monocultural only three or four different types of plants and you can work out why if you think about it with a sort of horticultural detective's head on it's because of all of the dog walkers because of all of the dogs they walk and because of the products of those dogs the canal towpath is utterly saturated in nitrogen and things that will break down to produce nitrogen so it leads towards a type of vegetation that can cope and thrive and grow in heavily nitrogen rich soil that's why you get that characteristic very nettle heavy flora on the towpath why all of those morning runs leave you coming back with with bumpy nettled arms anyway he he describes the most characteristic plant community of london the most distinctive plant community as the buddleia conzia shrub and that is taken from its two iconic plants buddleia from the foothills of the himalayas and conzia which is a uh, a flea bane i think they've actually now renamed them origron they're all they've all gone into the the origron category the origron genus with with mexican flea bane you might know them as conzia or origron canadensis or or is it sumatria um the one that comes from from tropical new world anyway they are from america and from china from central china and yet they are the most distinctive characteristic plants of london and that's just a, a symbol of the city really for good or bad it is a it is a place of wonders 80% of this environment 
is made up of plants completely non-native to the region. And there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. I was thinking about this in the senses of probabilities. You know that often quoted thing about the probabilities of shuffling a deck of cards in the exact same way twice. I think you're able to make 14 shuffles a second from when the universe was created and it all blows back on itself and you'll get nowhere near to, to getting them into the same position twice. I was thinking about that in terms of these fantastic community of plants never seen here before or never seen next to each other before. We're probably walking in our towns and cities past combinations of things that have never been seen before in horticulture and science. Probably every road we go down takes us past a thing that is utterly unique in terms of planting, intentional or otherwise, to, to that place in the universe. It's a, it's a very cool thought to, to toy with as you, you head off to, to buy the newspaper or, or buy a, a copy of an excellent gardening book or anything you, you might be thinking of buying around this time of year. Anyway, the, the garden here is no exception. As I moved on from the Buddleia to dealing with the Symphoricarpus albus. The Symphoricarpus albus is the snowberry. It is a member of the honeysuckle family. You can see that when you look at those, those droops, those big berries, uh, glaucous and white and very squishable. They're lovely to roll between your fingers until they feel liquid inside and then lob as hard as you can at a, at a window, preferably, because then you can see them splatter from the inside. So go and try that, kids, if you're, if you're listening. I was going to dig out a load of these plants, not over concern for, for windows, but over concern for the little bulbs that are going to be crowded out by these dense, dense shade givers. Not the snowdrops. Snowdrops live remarkably well under the deepest, deepest canopy. You can go into the woods around here and see a heavy canopy of something like a, a, a beam, a white beam, something in the in the Sorbus family, completely undergrown by a thick, thick layer of Semphoricarpus. So thick you'd think, how does that plant put on so much wood under such dense shade for most of the year? And then beneath that, you'll see a load of snowdrops flowering happily away beneath the bare stalks. They're amazing plants. So my rescue mission is not for the snowdrops, it's for their little relative, the one that often gets confused with them, which is the little snowflake, the, the Leucogium vernum, the very, very small Leucogium. They're the same colour as the snowdrop, same height as the snowdrop, same markings in green on many of the flowers. But while the snowdrop has the ability, when you see it in full sun, to open up, so you see those three outer petals separate from each other, almost like a propeller. The little leucogium, leucogium vernum, can't do so. It's much more of a, a composed bell. The outer petals are fused together and it looks like a, a very old-fashioned lampshade, just made inexplicably tiny and, and put in a flower bed. And that won't cope nearly as well in the deep, deep shade. It's not from this region. It has crept up here from, from more of the Mediterranean zone. And I like it. I think, it's, I think it's a delightful little thing. And I want to keep as much of the natural population in this garden as I can. So I am digging out the poor old Symphoricarpus. It was a job worth stealing myself for. You might notice that this podcast hasn't been out for a bit. Perhaps it's because in my subconsciousness I somehow knew that the next job I would be doing in the garden was, was digging out the snowberry and <laughs> therefore I didn't do any gardening. Um, but actually when I got round to it, it was remarkably easy. Snow Snowberry is 
almost a sort of rhizosoma shrub. It spreads by great, big, under-the-soil runners, far more than it does by by seeding. I know it's got it's got those droops, and each of them do have two seeds in them, and they were theoretically attractive to birds. But if you notice snowberry growing near you, you, you don't see it as a as an adventitious little seedling. You see it as the outer edge of a horde advancing from, from some other snowberry clump. So I was groaning in anticipation. So I got out one of those incredibly thick tined forks, the kind of thing that you could use to, to hold up the roof of a mine, and started hoying into the soil. And the roots just whoosh, to the surface. It was like fishing a, a twig out of a, a box of polystyrene packaging beads. It just just came out. I'm so, so unused to this light, sandy soil. After years of Hampshire clay and Buckinghamshire clay and London clay and sticky, airless stuff, to be able to to reach into the soil as if it was icing sugar is almost like a superpower. I feel that we're at the other way around and I was raised on such sandy stuff and then moved to, God forbid, Camberwell and tried to dig a hole there. I'd feel like a like a Samson without his hair, entirely, entirely weak and, and powerless. I'm sure I'm sure later on I will discover myriad problems that come with keeping keeping nutrition and, and moisture in this in this soil. And next time I'm back in London I will fall to the ground and, and dig my fingers into the yellowish ooze and shout, Oh my clay, my my long missed land. But at the moment I am comfortable being able to trace these roots back to their source, to to pull out one entire shrub and link it back to whence it came, link it back to the mother plant, and take that out as well. I'm not going to take out all of the Symphoricarpus. I like the leaves, I like the way the water beads on them in the summer, and the way they bruise under your thumbnail, like a, like a sort of spinachy leaf. And I also like their huge, huge attractiveness to pollinators. They are a hedge more butterfly and bee than flower in the late summer. I think like Buddleia, they probably have similar problems. Buddleia is is renowned for being the butterfly bush. It is an all-you-can-drink nectar kind of plant. If you smell it, you can tell, going back to our comparisons with lilac. But if you smell it, you can pick up that, yeah, this is just sugar. This plant is going, I've got loads of sugar. There aren't that many subtle undertones in the in the way you get with other plants but it is great at producing sugar what it's not good at doing is being well adapted to the digestive tracts of all our little local insects and mini beasts so not many things feed on it in comparison to to some native shrubs and i suspect it's similar for symphoricarpus it is a great benefit to solitary bumblebees but we don't have bears who eat it or all of those North American little species that are that are going to be feasting upon it. I am, as many listeners will be aware, very concerned with the fence line and not giving the eye any abrupt 90 degree angles between lawn or paved surface and vertical column. And I think the Symphoricarpus does a good job at sort of shuffling up between herbaceous height and fence top height and treetop height above it. It's useful in that regard. So I've sort of winnowed the, the population. I've, I've done more than decimate. Decimate is, is one in ten. I've um, septimated, or not sep, no, that would be just taking out one in. I've decimated, then decimated, then decimated, then decimated then decimated, which still leaves a fairly healthy population of Semphoricarpus hanging around on the on the borders of the garden. And then it was sundry tasks, taking out the last of the standing anemones 
and the various other bits of herbaceous stuff, cutting back the deciduous grass, the various penicetums, and clearing a few border edges, taking back the soil that's been kicked about by, by winter's caprice and putting it back where it ought to be and doing that little channel at the front of the border between the lawn and the border and the flick back that shows the world there is intelligence design here somewhere someone is in charge satisfying seasonal things that that link us to our to our spaces i've also been just vaguely pulling out some ground elder leaves and roots i'm going to try and keep on top of the ground elder population in a way in an almost sort of mindless hobby kind of way like you might pick up your knitting i'm going to go outside and pick up some some ground elder and um just just do it thoughtlessly it's hard to do while watching television but i can listen to a podcast and just sit there and let the sun get onto the back of the neck and pluck out leaves and roots they've just just started arriving the the ground elder leaves they're not in in full spate yet we're far behind the uk in that regard so they're still in that beautiful crinkly just unfurling stage i think ground elder is a lovely plant i think it's very attractive uh, in leaf and flower and even as they are emerging they are they are nice these little things so i do feel bad for um, for taking them away i should be eating them they are they are edible and i bet these fresh first ground elders of the the spring are delicious it's quite hard for me here it wouldn't have been 10 or 15 years ago because i would have been completely disconnected i would have just been enjoying my snowdrops under the symphoricarpus and the the aconites that are still out and the little leucogen vernums but those you will have noticed are early spring flowers and we still have them here we still have them here gone the middle of march and in the northerly no i don't mean northerly i mean north facing bits of the city Copenhagen is very flat but you do get north facing banks say the north facing bank of a railway line or the north facing bank of a major road that has been slightly sunken to to reduce traffic noise those north facing banks are still completely covered in snowdrops and aconites in their prime they haven't gone long and leafy and started dropping their their petals yet they are still perfect white and yellow and that is very late and once upon a time before modern technology connected us to everyone else's head we <laughs> would have enjoyed that but now i'm seeing pictures of tulips in london and euphorbia season is almost over over there all the wolf any eyes are out and um, here not a single sign i think the trick is to learn to appreciate what will be an extended spring it can be heartbreaking in London to see these ranks of flowers that you spent so long putting in and planning, the the anticipatory delight that you felt sitting in the chair with the three months of bulbs you'd put together, and then they come and they're done in five weeks, all mashed together and mangled, like like an army that has been told to to sprint rather than march, and has ended up all tangled and falling over itself. Here we're going to have a stately procession, and I'm hoping that the daffodils when they come the little tetetets are out in, in quite a few places and the tulips of which there are leafy signs but but no bulbs yet are going to linger for a dignified amount of time and really let us appreciate them i don't think for example that we're going to get that flowering gap that period of dog days in the middle of the summer where there's not really much going on here because our summer's going to be <laughs> so compressed I suppose I'll be able to steal the march in terms of posting the autumn colours a little bit before London. And in terms of putting out pictures of winter, well, I'll, I'll have loads more of those. I'll have, I'll have an extra three months of winter pictures. So, so that is something to be thankful for. Anyway, enough from me. Next week, I'm going along to start a new garden, which I'm very excited about. A beautiful, beautiful garden. Uh, run by the equivalent of the Danish Royal Horticultural Society. And it's a garden of compartments. There's uh, Japanese bits and English bits and 
Mediterranean bits. Really, really interesting stuff. I'm going there as a volunteer, which will be fun, because it's sometimes quite nice not to be in charge. So I'm going to go along and, and see see how, how we get on with a, with a few days a week over there. And I'm certain I will report back on that. Until then, I hope that you have a wonderful week. I oh, know I'm not doing the roundup. I'm going to see if I have any recommendations for you. Let's see if I have any recommendations for you this week. This week, I watched a fairly remarkable film. I watched a film called Taming the Garden, which is about an oligarch and Georgian politician and his sort of quixotic quest to build a theme park around ginormous native trees. And what he's doing is going around the country, buying up the village oak the mulberry that everyone has gathered round for generations in a particular village, digging it up with the kind of equipment you'd use to, to put a new harbour into a city and loading it onto barges, sailing it down the Black Sea to near Batumi, that resort town on the edge of the Black Sea, and setting them up in a garden there. It's a repulsive but thrilling concept. I have seen it and seen the damage it does to to the landscape and the environment, taking these things away, yet I still want to go and visit them in their in their tree theme park. It's beautifully, beautifully shot. There are images of these trees crossing the Black Sea, well going down the side of the Black Sea. We have fishermen in the background and passing through woods of static trees. Like they've been carried by a very slow landslide. And there's lots of smoke drifting through the woods. And the villagers get whole new roads built so that they can remove these trees. But in the way, vast, vast swathes of, of forest are chopped down so they can get out. There are beautiful, beautiful shots of this oak tree being hauled down a road in the dead of night. And you just see it silhouetted in the headlights of the two vast trucks that are below it. And this sense of ginormous, slow-moving bulk above in the darkness is quite Lovecraftian. You feel like you're watching an old one come back to Earth. But mainly what it's good for is the reaction of the villagers. The people in charge, the people who have commissioned this, are completely absent. They, they do not appear, but the villagers are all interviewed. And some of them are devastated, and some of them think that this is the way of the world. The man with money gets the tree. Why not? That's how it works. Some of them are saying, oh, it's my tree. I've loved it. I, I lived under there. I, I met my husband under that tree. And, and people try and reassure these, these wonderful old ladies saying... Well, don't worry, it'll look awful this year and awful next year, but in two years there'll be loads of new leaves and new trees around here. And they very reasonably answer, well, will I be alive in two years? It has particular relevance to me because I worked for an oligarch in my early days of my career. I worked for someone who's actually just had all of their assets frozen by the British state, which is which is quite exciting, including, I guess, the, the gardens that I've worked in. But... Um, well, I suppose it's good luck proving it. And anyway, the um, there's a section in the in the Grove in the book where I'm talking about how it gave me a thrill, a pleasure, to know that no matter how much this person wanted to spend in their garden, no matter how many bad taste purchases he was willing to make, he could never have the most beautiful trees because the most beautiful trees are beautiful because they grow in a setting, they grow on a village green, they shape themselves to it, they grow in the front garden of a Georgian townhouse and shape themselves to the, the contours of that garden and they would never fit down a road, they would never fit down the slow lane of the M1. And then you realise watching this programme, well that's not true, 
if you've got enough money, you can do anything. And I bet you could do it here. I bet you could say, no, I'm afraid I need to knock down these houses. I need to widen the motorway if you have enough cash to pay to the right people. So that was a sobering thought to contend with my, my naive shreds of belief in the fact that the beauty can conquer money. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. We all have our bits of beauty to be getting on with. I'm about to pop on my once smart coat and head into the garden. I can see a little flower bed down there that, that probably needs a bit of definition. I'm sitting out here looking over the, the gardens and I can see my neighbour's garden there. They've got a fantastic apple tree in there, brilliantly well pruned. So maybe I will maybe I will transport that into my own little tree museum. I'll go and make an offer for it. While I do that, I hope you have a wonderful week, whether you are in the garden or not. Remember that I am in the UK in the first week of April, April the 4th, April the 6th and April the 8th giving talks about the, the Grove and about other things in Bath, in Petersfield and in London. I really, really do hope to see some of you there. But if not, keep listening and I'll see you all in episode 97 of The Garden Log. Thank you and goodbye.